Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 15, Regulation of Gene Expression. So this is maybe not the most exciting picture that I picked for this chapter. Um, it's just a, a bunch of on-off switches. So this, this is a short chapter, which is kind of nice compared to the ones we've done recently. Um, but there's some very important concepts that can be a little difficult to understand at times. So before we get into it, there's, there's two main principles I want you to have in your head as we go through this. And the first is that cells cannot be wasteful, right? Cells cannot be wasteful. Cells have limited resources. They can't waste what they have. Therefore, life cannot be wasteful. Life has to take advantage of what surroundings it finds itself in and use what it, what it has and make only what it doesn't have. The second concept is that, you know, you, you know this. You were once a zygote. You were once a single cell. That single cell had all of your genes. That single cell with the mitosis to form all of your cells today. So all of your cells contain all of your genes, right? But do all of your cells express all of your genes? Of course not, right? The cells of your pancreas make insulin, um, but the cells of my peaky toe also have the gene for insulin. So how does the cell regulate that? Well, cells can turn genes on or off depending upon the environment and depending upon what kind of cell that it is. So cells cannot be wasteful. All of your cells contain all of your genes, but genes can be turned off when they're not needed, okay? Um, these next two slides just kind of go through some conceptual stuff. So prokaryotes, bacteria, and eukaryotes, like your cells, they can alter gene expression depending upon their environment. We've already said that. Multi-cell things also maintain several different types of cells, like skin cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, bone cells, blood cells. That's all like coded for at the gene level. What makes a bone cell a bone cell comes from what genes are turned on or turned off. How you regulate transcription, we're going to see in this chapter. And again, this slide just goes to the fact that cells cannot waste. Cells, you know, natural selection favors bacteria that only produce things the cell needs, not what it already has. And uh, this, this slide, we, we looked at this slide, I believe, back in like chapter two or three. This is um, feedback inhibition. Let's just review this real quick. So this is a, a reaction cascade where I need five different genes to make tryptophan, um, which is an amino acid. If the cell has tryptophan, should it waste time making it? No. So the molecule itself, tryptophan number one, it inhibits um, the first enzyme and the cascade to make it. And it also inhibits uh, the TRPC gene, which codes for enzyme two. So there's two different ways that tryptophan turns off its own formation. This is called negative feedback because tryptophan like turns the process off. So it makes it happen less, so it's negative feedback. Um, what we're going to go through in this chapter is the concept of the operon. And I want to, I want to try and teach this using the diagrams more than the words. We need to go through the words because the words are important. Operons, first off, are things that bacteria do. You do not have operons. Um, specifically, the bacteria E. coli is where these were discovered, but other, other kinds of bacteria can do this. Let me just read these to you real quick, and then we're going to go to a diagram. So the basic concept. So the operator is a segment of DNA that acts as a switch. It is within the promoter. Remember, the promoter was where RNA polymerase bound before the gene to transcribe the gene. It's a switch. The operator can turn the gene on or turn it off. The operon is the entire stretch of DNA that includes the operator, the promoter, and the actual gene. The whole thing is called the operon. A repressor is a protein that turns the operon off. It literally blocks RNA polymerase. The regulatory gene codes for the repressor, and a co-repressor is a molecule that turns the repressor on or off. Okay, so there's several different switches, which is why they get, this can get kind of complicated. The first one we're gonna look at is called the TRIP operon for tryptophan. We'll, we'll go through these words. I wanna teach this using the diagram though. So this is the TRIP operon. Just take a minute and, and look at it. There are five different genes to make tryptophan. Each one codes for an enzyme. We've said this before. What's kind of nice is the genes are like in sequence, so the cell can transcribe all of them at once um, in one RNA polymerase, so it's just kind of efficient. Um, this guitar pick-shaped thing is RNA polymerase. It binds to the Tata box and the promoter. The operator is this Lego-looking thing between uh, the promoter, what's in the promoter is between RNA polymerase and the actual gene. And notice there's like this, these little square shaped boxes. If something binds here, it physically blocks polymerase. 
okay? Now, this molecule is called the repressor, and it's made by a different gene somewhere else. Um, I don't know where it is. This shows it being um, upstream. It's, it could be on a different chromosome. Who cares where it is? The repressor protein is the protein that's going to block polymerase, but it's made initially in an inactive form. So the way this picture is shown, Yafran's turned on because the repressor is turned off. Now, take a wild guess what turns the repressor on. Tryptophan does. So if the cell has tryptophan, should it make it? No. So tryptophan turns the repressor on, which turns the operon off. Okay? Um, think about it. If the cell doesn't have tryptophan, then the repressor is the wrong shape to repress the operon. Okay? So going back to the previous slide, this is called a repressible operon because it's usually turned on and the repressor turns it off. And the cell usually does this with, with products that it, it can make, but doesn't need to make unless it doesn't have it, okay? Um, oftentimes anabolic processes, remember anabolic was building stuff, are repressible operons because you can turn them off. They are initially turned on. Okay, so what I suggest you do is read through these words, pause the video at some point, look at this diagram. You would never have to draw this diagram from scratch, but if, if the AP exam gave it to you or asked you questions about it, you should understand it. Okay, so that was one example. Let's do another example. So the lac operon. The lac operon stands for lacto, or, I'm sorry, it stands for lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose, right? Now, should the cell make lactase if there's no lactose? No, it shouldn't. That would be wasteful. So the lac operon is initially turned off, and it's an inducible operon that's turned on by the molecule, take a wild guess, lactose. So let's go through this one in a picture. So this is a similar picture to the trip operon, right? Here I need three genes to make lactase. Here's the promoter, here's the way the repressor binds. In this case, the difference is the repressor is initially um, active and the, the co-repressor is what turns, um, or not, not co-repressor, the inducer rather, I said that wrong, the inducer is what turns the repressor off, okay? So this slide shows this little green circle, I need that bar to go away. The green circle um, is allolactose. So I said 30 seconds ago that lactose is what turns um, the operon on. It's actually allolactose, which is an isomer of lactose. Don't worry too much about that. Just keep in mind, if you have lactose, you have allolactose. So allolactose um, turns off the repressor, which turns on the operon. So let me say that one more time. So initially, the operon is turned off because the repressor is turned on. Lactose, as an allolactose, turns the repressor off, which turns the operon on, okay? Going back to the previous slide, this is an inducible operon because initially it's turned off, and the inducer, lactose or allolactose, turns it on. And again, what's the whole point? The whole point is so the cell doesn't, um, build things that it already has, and it doesn't build things, doesn't build enzymes that it doesn't have the substrate to break down. This slide compares the two. Both of these are negative feedback because, because you're, at some point you're blocking gene expression by blocking polymerase. Inducible ones are, <coughs> excuse me, are usually catabolic, things that you break down. You don't want to break it down if you don't have it, right? Repressible ones, like the trip operon, are usually things that you, um, they're anabolic molecules that you build, you don't wanna build them unless you don't have them, okay? So take, take a little time and look at these two operons, compare and contrast them. Um, this is a way that cells avoid being wasteful. Okay, so this slide, we're gonna transition from, from prokaryotes, from bacteria, to eukaryotic cells like your cells. So the word or the term that's bold on this slide says differential gene expression. So, you know, don't get bogged down by the details. The details are important, but let's talk about, you know, the, the whole forest first. So all of your cells have all of your genes. What would it be like if all of your, if all of the genes in every cell, they were all turned on and all your cells express all your genes simultaneously? That would 
whoa, that would, they would just be, you would, you would freeze up and die. Like that would just be like a, a computer crash and you, you can't do that. Differential gene expression was the idea that you all, you know, all your cells have the same genome, but what genes are turned on and what genes are turned off differs in different kinds of cells. This idea of cell specialization, it's just the idea that you have cells that do different things. The genes that are turned on in my heart compared to the genes that are turned on in my brain are different. Or, or a different example, the, the genes that are turned on when I'm a two-month-old baby compared to the genes that are turned on when you're an 80-year-old man are also going to be very, very different kinds of genes. At puberty, certain genes get turned on or turned off at different times um, during development. So because we're multicellular and all our cells aren't doing the same thing, we express genes differently. Um, abnormalities in gene expression can lead to cancer, which we'll get to actually in, in the next chapter. Now, the end of this chapter, so this little flow chart that's up here, goes through all the different ways that you control gene expression in eukaryotic cells from actually at the DNA to at the end at the protein level. So we're gonna go through this diagram. Right now it might look intimidating. It will look less intimidating in just a minute, okay? Okay, so right now we're in the nucleus. Regulation of chromatin structure. So remember we said back in a previous chapter that when you tightly wind up DNA, you basically turn it off. And then if you loosen up the DNA, you basically turn it on. Remember heterochromatin was what you call DNA that is tightly condensed. Euchromatin's DNA that's, that's loose and, and is expressed. This term histone acetylation, that's a fun thing to say 10 times twice or 10 times fast, histone acetylation. Acetyl groups are a kind of functional group. You don't really need to know what their structure is. But if I remember the histones were those proteins the DNA is wrapped around. If I acetylate the histones, you loosen up the DNA so it's more highly expressed. So histone acetylation unwinds DNA or, or loosens it, uncondenses it, which makes those genes expressed. Um, the opposite is called DNA methylation which is simply adding methyl groups to DNA. If you highly methylate a gene, you turn it off. So acetylating it turns it on, methylating it turns it off, okay? Now, this leads us to a very important concept called epigenetics or epigenetic inheritance at the bottom of the slide. So, you know, the genes that you inherit from your parents, barring mutations, they don't change. But whether they are methylated or not, can change. So let's say that my mom passes on to me a gene that is methylated and is turned off, and I inherit that gene already methylated, then for me, that gene is already turned off. For example, things like cigarette smoke, things like carcinogens can affect your DNA. Obviously, they can mutate your DNA, which that's for sure likely bad. But if like cigarette smoke causes the genes to be methylated, then it turns the genes off. I'm just giving smoke as this one example. Epigenetic inheritance is the idea of, like you inherit more than just your genes. You also inherit are the genes turned on or turned off. In your environment, like smoke, can methylate or cause genes to be methylated. So the environment, the egg and sperm we're in, impacts how the genes are expressed, even if you don't actually change the nucleotide sequence. So the whole nature versus nurture debate, na you know, nature is your genes, right? Well, nurture is the environment you're in. And if the environment you're in causes DNA to be methylated, that'll change it, right? And you can inherit genes that are already methylated. Um, that's the idea of epigenetic inheritance, inheriting genes that are already turned on or turned off, going apart from the nucleotide sequence, like what's on the gene. You can reverse this. The genes can become unmethylated for sure. So we're here in our um, flowchart, okay? All right, transcription factors. The book goes into way more detail than we need to. Let me skip ahead for a second. Do you remember back in chapter uh, 14, the last chapter, we discussed these uh, transcription factors, these purple molecules that help polymerase combine. Just file away there are these molecules called transcription factors and if you have them it helps polymerase bind if polymerase can't bind the gene is turned off right so transcription factors help turn genes on and notice like these activators they can be way far away but because the dna can bend over um, they can actually come and touch the gene 
Um, these are just factors that, that assist polymerase in binding. So just file away and you know, they happen during transcription, the name gives that away. So this is inside the nucleus, okay? So we've done transcription. That's all that I wanna say about transcription factors. Trust me, you'll thank me later. So post-transcriptional regulation, so alternative RNA splicing. So we talked about this when we did introns and exons. So this is the idea. Remember, splicing was when you cut out the introns. You can splice the same gene different ways. So this is a gene for a molecule called troponin, which is part of your muscle cells. And I can, you know, here I have five different segments. I can splice it, one, two, three, that, that bar is just the bane of my existence. I can splice it one, two, three, five, or one, two, four, five. One gene can be spliced different ways. So how you splice it, you know, impacts what version of the gene you have. This is post-transcriptional because it's, it's after transcription, but it's before the RNA leaves the nucleus. So it's before translation. Um, mRNA degradation. So this is super duper important. This, one, this might be my favorite one of all of these. So let's say that I have a gene. Say it's the gene for insulin, all right? And right now, I make 100 messenger RNAs of the gene for insulin, all right? And I release them, they're off doing their job, and then right after that, I turn the gene for insulin off. So the gene for insulin is out of commission. Well, those 100 RNAs, what's happening to them? Well, they're being translated in, into proteins. So the gene's turned off, but I'm still making insulin because the messenger RNAs are still there. You know, I, I, I killed the source, but the messengers are still working. So without those messenger RNAs, you know, eventually they're going to degrade. What if they last for five minutes? What if they last for a hundred years, right? If they last for a hundred years, it's like the gene is still turned on. So the lifespan, the life, the, the length of time the messenger RNAs survive in the cytoplasm makes a huge deal, right? I could have a gene that's turned on big time, but the messenger RNAs only last a millisecond. And it's, it's as if it's turned off. I can have genes that I turned off decades ago. That's a bit of an exaggeration. But the RNAs are still there, so the effect is still there, so it's like they're still turned on. So the life cycle or the lifespan of the messenger RNAs makes a huge deal. How you regulate that, we'll see in a minute. Um, generally speaking, eukaryotic messenger RNAs live longer. And I say the word live. They last longer than prokaryotic messenger RNAs. Um, Remember, actually, I'll say, now remember you added that five prime G cap and the poly A tail, those things, the longer the poly A tail, the longer the messenger RNA survives in the cytoplasm. Some messenger RNAs you might want to degrade because again, if they're there forever, you're always making that, that protein. So eventually you want them to degrade so you stop making them until you need them again and then turn the gene back on. Okay, so right now we are here, right? <clears throat> so now let's go into the cytoplasm. So. I have a messenger RNA, it's in the cytoplasm. It's ready to be translated, ribosomes, come, come get me, come do it. Well, there are regulatory proteins that can block translation. Um, let me give you an example of what, why you would wanna do this. This, this has actually been on the AP exam before. Let, let me tell you a story. Well, not a story, but an actual example. So an unfertilized egg, so a woman ovulates an egg, right? That egg, you know, most eggs that a woman ovulates don't get fertilized, right? Um, when the egg is ovulated, it's already made hundreds, if not thousands of messenger RNAs that are already in the cytoplasm and they're ready to go, right? But they're not expressed, they're not translated unless the egg gets fertilized. So you think of it as like, I mean, it, you might think of it as being kind of wasteful. Why would you make messenger RNAs that you might never need? Well, the thing is, when the egg gets fertilized, they all get turned on at once. And, you know, the cell starts going through mitosis very, very rapidly. So it's basically the cell, like, preparing for fertilization. Um, it's easier to have made a thousand messenger RNAs up front and not need them than to wait for fertilization and then have to make them all, like, from scratch at once. Um, so many times a cell will make messenger RNAs and have them inactivated by regulatory proteins in some event like fertilization triggers them being activated all right um, it's easier to control expression not easier let's say it's more efficient to control expression at the messenger rna level than it is back at the gene remember one gene can be a thousand messenger rnas right 
So go ahead and make them. And if you need them, you turn them all on at once, bam, huge effect. If you have to wait to make a thousand of them, that just takes a lot of time, all right? So it's like the egg cell is prepared to be fertilized whether it is or not. Okay, so here, now we are here, right? We're moving along pretty, pretty rapidly here. Okay, so I, I made insulin, I made my proteins. Well, how long do the, protein, does the, the, the proteins last? If I turn the gene for insulin off, but the insulin that I made last week lasts for 100 years, it's like the gene is always turned on. And you know, if insulin's all, you know, back up, back up. Insulin brings your blood sugar down. So the insulin that I make is always active. Your blood sugar will crash until eventually you die. So I want insulin to eventually be degraded. I want, I want to turn it off, right? Um, there's a protein called ubiquitin. That's this point down here where the cell can mark proteins for destruction. So the length of time that a protein is functional, you know, again, I could have turned the gene off way back in the nucleus, but the proteins last forever. It's like it's always turned on. Um, this just reviews things I can do to regulate gene expression in the, in the nucleus, through transcription, RNA processing, how long the RNA is last, and then uh, regulating translation and protein degradation in the cytoplasm. This slide just reviews all the ones that we just did. So let's end with, with some technologies for how you can, you can study this. So this slide is super important. A scientist figuring out, is a gene turned on or is it turned off? That's really hard to do. Like, actually back up. Doing that by actually finding the gene. And like finding the gene and saying, is it acetylated, is it methylated? Like looking at the gene is hard, right? The easier way is just to go on the cytoplasm and say, do I see the messenger RNAs? It's like wanting to know if a, if a dictionary has been used. Well, if I can tell that it's been photocopied 100 times in the past hour, it's been used a lot, right? So it's looking for the photocopies, which are the messenger RNAs. So the best thing to do is to take samples of the cytoplasm and see if you can detect messenger RNAs. If you can, the gene's turned on. If you cannot, the gene is turned off. If that doesn't make sense, replay that again because that's a super important concept. So the technique that we use is called nucleic acid hybridization. So say that I'm looking for a messenger RNA. The sequence is um, G, 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 a bunch of Gs. And I'm looking for that messenger RNA. What I can do in a lab is I can make a piece of DNA or RNA that shows a bunch of Cs repeated, and I can tag it with a fluorescent dye. In this picture, this is... This is the embryo of, I want to say it's some kind of insect. Um, anyway, so I'm making a bunch of Cs, tag it yellow, and then put it into the cell or put it into the test tube or whatever sample is. And if, like if I have the sequence of Gs, the Cs will bind to it, do the hydrogen bonds of, of DNA base pairing, and then give it a gentle wash to wash away the ones that don't stick, and then see if it glows. If it glows, it sticks, it's there, which means the gene is there or the RNA is there. Um, in this picture, each color, the yellow, the red, the purple, the green, or the blue is a different fluorescent tag. So, so it's a different RNA sequence or DNA sequence, either one. And here you can tell not only is it turned on, but where in the embryo is it turned on, all right? That's called in situ hybridization because um, you can do it like with an organism that's, that, that's like intact, it could possibly still be alive. Um, we're gonna visit uh, or meet reverse transcriptase maybe in the next chapter, I'm not sure. So one thing that you can do, so reverse transcriptase PCR or RT-PCR, um, this is one way they detect COVID-19 in cells actually. They, they're looking for the messenger RNA or the, the RNAs from COVID-19 is an RNA virus, so to detect the RNA is like we're, we're looking for them, and you copy them by using PCR. So you make this thing called cDNA, the C stands for complementary, and what I can do, so say I find the messenger RNAs, I've got a bunch of them, I can turn those back into DNA using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It's a very cool enzyme, um, it's my favorite enzyme. We'll see it again in, in the next chapter. It does transcription backwards. It turns RNA back into DNA. It's called cDNA because it's complementary to the RNA sequence. This is how they made the gene for insulin from humans without the introns.
they found the RNA for insulin in our cytoplasms, used reverse transcriptors to turn it back into DNA. And because it was based on the RNA, the introns were already gone. And then put that version into bacteria to make human insulin. And then you, once you've made it, you use PCR to copy it a gazillion times. Because PCR is the tool remember, that we discussed back in chapter 13, I believe, that copies DNA super fast. This just shows what I do. So I have a test tube with the messenger RNAs, the red things, and the enzyme reverse transcriptase. They copy the strand into DNA, get rid of the RNA, use polymerase to make it the complementary strand of DNA. And here you have a double-stranded piece of DNA that you made in a lab based upon the RNAs that were in um, the cytoplasm. Um, when we discuss gel, uh, gel electrophoresis, the, um, if we've done this lab in class already, this will make more sense if we haven't done it yet or haven't discussed it yet. So the thickness of the band, the, these bands are all the same size, right? Because they're the same distance, but they can be thicker. The thicker the band means the more DNA is there. So the gene is expressed more if the band is thicker because they were more messenger RNAs. The last thing I want to end with, and this is a minor point, but it's worth mentioning briefly, are these things called DNA microassays. This is a, a picture of a DNA microchip. And each of these little wells, I mean, this, this chip, which is like maybe that big, these wells have, gosh, I mean, there's hundreds of them. I'm not going to count them. There's, there's a lot of them. Every well basically contains um, different DNA fragments. And like it could be the fragments, I mean, you name it, you can pick what fragments are on it. Um, maybe, they, maybe they represent different developmental parts of, a, of a, an organism or you know, the gene for hemoglobin in different stages or, or whatever, who cares what it is. Each, each little well, little circle contains a different fragment of DNA. And then what I can do is take a sample, um, take the RNAs from a sample and wash the cell with the, or wash the chip with the RNAs and the ones that stick, oh, I also tag them with, with fluorescence so I can, so they actually glow. Bathe the chip with the messenger RNAs. If they stick, it's because they're complementary in, in sequence. And then wash it to get, to get rid of the excess. And like in this picture, I had fragments that glowed red. I had some that glowed green. If a well is glowing green, it has whatever whatever the ones that were tagged green. If it has red, they were red. If it glows yellow, it has both of them because both of them stick. So, you know, yellow and or red and green light make yellow light, right? And if it doesn't have any of them, those, those wells are black. So I basically make these little microchips or the, or the DNA chips, bathe the whole thing with a sample of messenger RNAs from whatever cell. And the ones that glow, you know which, which DNA fragments the organism had because they, they stick. You're using the base pairing codes, all right? If that didn't make sense, that's, that's not a huge deal, but just recognize how quickly I can determine what genes are turned on, not by looking at the genes, but by looking at what messenger RNAs are in the cytoplasm. Okay, that was a whirlwind, but that's enough for one video. I hope that was helpful, and I will see you guys next time.